Hi, everyone. I'm Fraser Cain. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy journalist for over 20 years. I like to bring you behind the scenes to talk to the researchers who are actually working on the science that we're reporting on. And today, I'm joined by Annika Rollick. Annika, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. All right. The question I always like to ask people, who are you? What do you do? Yeah, so my name is Annika Rolick. I am a PhD researcher, or I guess student here at CU Boulder, um, and I am working with Professor David Klaus, and I work on space habitats. Um, specifically, so cool. I work with NASA on next generation space habitats. So, so then compared to the space habitats that exist today, what are the next generation space habitats? I guess we're yeah, about so the International start, Space Station. Yeah, so I should start by saying a habitat is somewhere where people, specifically right now, astronauts live and work in space. So the ISS, the International Space Station, is a habitat. Um, and ideally, our, our next generation habitats will be um, at places like the lunar surface or the Martian surface. And I guess, what are the, I guess, the issues that you're looking at are, that need to be addressed for us to be able to take these next steps? Uh, so like, which are the issues? Is that Yeah, yeah. What are the issues that we need to address to take the next steps? Yeah, so there's there's a lot. <laughs> um, specifically, uh, some of the big ones is I'm in bioastronautics. So we focus a lot on um, what it's like for humans to live and work in space. Um, and space is pretty harsh on the body. So there's a lot of um, physiological concerns. So obviously, the classic ones are like you lose muscle mass and bone density. Um, you get some vision degradation over time as well. Um, and just like so, psychologically, it's it's tough. Yeah. Sorry, what degradation? Uh, vision. Oh, vision. So right. Eyesight. Yeah, your eyes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. And so there's that. Yeah. Those are problems, and not easily. So I mean, those are the ones. Those are the ones that have not been solved by them endlessly working out, eating well, doing what they can to minimize the damage. You have to have gravity to sort those problems out probably yeah and the big concern is is when you get if you go to mars you're you know in transit for months at a time and you arrive there and you might have to put together habitat you might have to carry cargo to and from uh your landing vehicle and so you don't want people to, to strain themselves or break a bone break a hip you know <laughs> from from bone loss um oh. so that's one thing and then second of all it's just really far away so there um there's some some issues around basically taking the state of the art how we currently do things and trying to adjust them for when we, if we're at Mars, we're going to have a communication delay. And then we're also going to not be able to rely on um, as frequent resupply as we currently do. So the International Station, Space Station gets a lot of uh, resupply trips and uh, obviously fresh food, fresh produce, um, extra water, extra things, spare parts. Um, and, you know, when you're waiting months for those to arrive, the needs of the mission might change while that's on, on route. So definitely a different scenario. And you mentioned in your research, the time delay isn't helping either. Yeah, so there's been a lot of different studies trying to kind of quantify how bad of a time delay is too bad. Um, and even with um, time delays of only a few seconds, it becomes really difficult for astronauts uh, to speak back to um, to ground when they're trying to do different procedures. You're talking over each other, you know, even on Zoom, I think in the past you know, few years, people have seen that just with the, the time delay from uh, one computer to another. Um, and so when you get to Mars, that, that delay goes up to six to 44 minutes. And then sometimes it just goes into a total, sorry, that's round trip. Um, right, and right, then right. to the total blackout if the sun's in the way um, or if the, the planets turn the wrong way. So. so then I guess in doing your paper, what was the, what was the perspective? Were you identifying problems or suggesting solutions? Um, a bit of both. So the perspective is actually, uh, my work is spinning out of a NASA project. Um, it's an STRI, uh, which is a Space Technology Research Institute. Um, and the focus of that STRI is on um, building habitats that are self-reliant. So habitats that can take care of themselves, um, because a lot of deep space plans actually have um, periods where the crew just won't be there. Um, a lot of NASA's plans have intermittently crewed uh, habitats. And so this is a big project across a bunch of different universities and we're all looking at different aspects. Um, and so we're looking at things that can, you know, different um, machine learning, learning algorithms or a digital twin that can help inform the spacecraft of different information that it needs or help uh, prognose or diagnose things. Um, we're also looking at robotics and then human robot teaming. Um, and my work is more on how do we actually quantify the benefit of this technology um, before we start spending the money on it? Because a lot of it just hasn't flown yet. It hasn't had a, 
um, a flight version, a flight model yet. And so we need to figure out what's worth investing in now for when we do eventually want to go somewhere like Mars um, and what's going to be the most return on investment for those things. Like the International Space Station has been continuously inhabited since its launch 20 plus years ago. And that's exciting and partly out of necessity. Like if, if, and we had a couple of times where people weren't sure if they were going to be able to keep the station continuously inhabited. And there were worries that it would, it would be the doom of the station because I don't think people realize the astronauts are up there. They're doing maintenance nonstop to keep that machine running. Is that, you know, what lessons have been learned from that that can then apply to to the kinds of, of future space stations? Yeah, that's that's exactly it. Um, one of the, the big lessons I can think of spinning off of that is um, something as small as uh, commonality. So making sure a lot of your parts are hmm. the same is really important. So um, ISS has a bunch of different fans and the fans all have different fan blades and it's become kind of a huge pain because it's like if a fan blade breaks and it's or a part of a fan breaks and it's not the right, you don't have the right part, you have to do a whole launch to get something up to, to ISS. Um, so lessons learned about making sure your parts are interchangeable, you have kind of a common set of parts. Um, that's why additive manufacturing is actually really yeah. promising too, because then you can hopefully 3D print something um, in space if you need a specific part. Um, astronaut crew time is also really valuable. Um, and so, you know, we're spending X amount of money to send someone up there and they should be doing research. And frankly, in the past, a lot of astronauts have had um, very hectic schedules. And so a lot of that has been on maintenance, repair, um, and unexpected maintenance uh, on things that are, you know, important, like, like CEDRA, like the carbon dioxide removal apparatus that keeps people alive. And so that's a pretty high stress scenario, right? So trying to make things more robust so that they just don't break down as much is actually a really high priority also. Yeah, it was interesting. I, I talked to Don Pettit one time over a beer about his experience on the International Space Station and talking about how every day they spend they spend many hours just exercising to make sure that their bodies are in the best possible condition. But then also that there's just all this maintenance that needs to be done on all of this equipment that is that their lives depend on. And you mentioned the CO2 scrubbers, and there's all kinds of this stuff. And that the time that remains is actually a few minutes every hour that they're actually able to do the science that they were sent there in the first place. And it was it was interesting to me, I, I use that conversation as a way to kind of get me through tough times when, you know, you have to wash the dishes or you have like just the things that you have to do to maintain your existence, but they are part of your existence. And anything that we can do, and you really appreciate labor saving devices down here on Earth, a dishwasher, for example. And I can just imagine every minute that you could give these astronauts is gold. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's also a flip side of that, though. So um, this is actually more of my my lab mates work um, on kind of this desirability of who wants to do what tasks. So say you could automate everything. Um, you had kind of a, a, a robot floating around doing all the repairs and the cleaning. Um, well, the astronauts don't have anything to do that, right? And it's if we're going to Mars, that's a few month journey. So it's like, what do you actually have them doing during that time? Hopefully some science. Um, but there's a sense of, I guess, um, usefulness that comes from upkeeping, you know, your living situation, your, your, you know, your spacecraft, um, that we want to make sure astronauts have the option to do that if they want to, because they'll feel useful. Um, and you know, you want to be feel that's useful. That's interesting. So you got to balance it out. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. that's also it comes down to individual choice too, right? Like, yeah. So then you just mentioned one aspect, which is, I guess, having interoperability of parts, but I'm sure the list of suggestions that would go into some level, I guess, of both autonomy of the station itself, while there's not astronauts on board, but also autonomy of the station, when there are astronauts on on board. Um, I'd love to hear more examples of, of ideas that that you're proposing. Yeah, so that's a really good way to describe it. And that's actually how a lot of the field talks about it, where it's giving the crew autonomy. Um, so um, I'm sure you're, you're pretty familiar with the way uh, ISS currently operates, but it's there's a decision hi uh, command hierarchy. And oftentimes the flight director or the ground has final say in a lot of situations. And if you are waiting a few minutes um, for you know a go, no go, or you're on EVA and you have a limited time that you have consumables going for that EVA, you wanna be able to 
uh, make decisions on the fly and reroute as necessary. And so some of that just comes down to like changing the procedures. So it's giving the astronauts some autonomy to make those decisions themselves, to make a game time decision. Um, and kind of as scary it is, as it is kind of, you know, take your foot off the gas on the ground side um, and hopefully let the astronauts kind of figure it out as they go. And some of that's harder <laughs> and it's easier said than done um, because ground is an incredible resource and they have experts who know systems in and out um, because, you know, astronauts can't carry around that all of that inside their brain. Um, and so there's a balance there and trying to put all of that information and that subject matter expertise into something on board the station um, or the habitat um, is pretty critical. Yeah. I always think of that classic scene from Apollo 13 where they dump all those parts out onto the table and go, we have to make this talk to this using this. And, yep. and it's the engineers on the ground that are solving this problem. And then the astronauts are able to implement that solution. You really do have access to this gigantic brain. Although as those time delays increase, you have less and less access to that mind, that collective human hive mind to help you think better ideas, which is, which is, is tricky. Do, do you get a sense how prepared we are today for say the lunar gateway, which I know is going to have some level of autonomy. that's not going to be continuously inhabited. What do you think are from from your research? What are some of the big key problems, challenges that need to be overcome for a, a station like that to be sustainable out by the orbit of the moon? Yeah, there's there's a few things off the top of my head. Um, I did mention, but um, just updating procedures. Uh, I, I'm also not a I'm not a flight controller. I'm not a, an official NASA employee. I just work with NASA, um, and our research is funded through that. But um, the the currently as it stands, they've done kind of practice for lunar delay, and so they've done flight controller practice, talking to astronauts on a sortie who are out on the lunar surface, um, making sure that they can handle um, those operations. And they'll it can be as simple as just writing down the tasks because then astronauts can refer back to it rather than being like, Hey, can you repeat that? And then waiting a few seconds back and forth. Right. Um, so that's super simple in terms of having something like gateway. Um, yeah. Having things be robust is really important. Um, having redundancy and then um, also just giving, I, I don't like to use the word smart, even though NASA likes to use the word smart have as kind of a goal. Um, but you do want to make, the habitat smarter, right? And that's of course kind of leaked into our like consumerism in terms of like, we have smartphones and smart houses, um, smart thermostats, right? And like, it's kind of lost meaning, but it really is important to have a habitat that can uh, be aware when say a CO2 scrubber isn't functioning at the best capacity or maybe when the lights is off or something is wrong. Mm. And so technology like digital twins is really important for that. So an awareness of kind of what the actual um, habitat knows about itself. So it can then inform astronauts when they come back, what's going on. That's, that's interesting. Like, you know, again, y you want to have some level of redundancy, but you also want to, you know, the two is one and one is none issue. Um, and so having the habitat, keep an eye on the fan and know exactly how much noise it's generating or whatever, whatever its points of failure are, mm -hmm. does, right now say on the ISS is a fan just a fan like it's plugged in and it spins and if it breaks then it's broken do they have that kind of of intelligence going on behind the scenes is it being tested out uh yes yeah they do have some intelligence so there are um I think it's a few hundred thousand sensors on the oh. station right now so there's a lot of data coming down yeah um and right now ground is responsible for kind of pouring over that data um and so it's like looking at pressure and being like oh is that pressure drop too much over a fan or too little um, which sounds, you know, like a little bit tedious and at somewhere like the moon ground can still do that. Right. And so we can still command, um, we, we command the ISS constantly, right. A lot of that stuff isn't actually astronauts like steering the ISS it's, it's ground commands. Um, and you can also do things like teleoperation, which is when you remotely operate either a robotic arm or a robot inside to do some of those repairs. Um, and so we do have data, the kind of crux of the issue, issue is always, um, making sense of that data and, you know, astronauts can't pour over thousands of data points when they arrive. And even ground control has issues with that. So being able to recognize what is anomalous, what is a problem, what is a failure versus just degradation, um, that's really important. Um, and also recognizing or trying to recognize when the sensor is just giving you wrong information, right? So if your check engine light 
isn't on, but it's because the light is broken, then that's still an issue, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, I didn't realize there were that many sensors on board the station, and nobody has time to look through the pref pressure differential on the exhaust fan on the Zvezda module, right? Like that's that's a lot of information to, to look through or the I guess or the voltage that that fan is using to detect if its bearings are wearing out or, or whatever. And having all that information go into the do you see that information being handled locally, or being continued to be sent back to Earth and, and understood or some some balance between the two? It's probably always going to be a mix of the two. Um, I don't see a world in which Brown doesn't want that data because they also want to be able to process it differently than maybe um, whatever's on board was processing it. Um, but really bringing all of that on board helps deal with those things like communication delays um, and just having, you know, the ground availability. And like, I don't want to over anthropomorphize it, but it kind of sounds like you're turning the station into one of the crew members. Yeah, we, we actually have a lot of discussion about that. Um, yeah, it feels like that sometimes. Um, you yeah. want to make sure the habitat is, you know, part of the crew and, and you start treating them all like agents. Um, so you have, you know, the, the computer is an agent, the station is an agent, maybe a robot would be an agent, but the crew member is also an agent. And so it's when you're talking about who does what, um, it, it gets kind of funny because you say, oh, but the habitat does it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Habitat. You know, how are you feeling yeah. today? It feels like, you know, HAL 9000. We do a lot of yeah. uh, jokes about yeah. you know, the killer robots. And or, the, or the one from AI. Moon. Right. But yeah. I know what you mean, that you're that at a certain point, you are interacting with an anthropomorphized station that is that its job is to keep you alive. Yeah. And that's a whole other can of worms, right? Because then you have this idea of trust. And it's, you know, it, that's a big issue with um, self-driving cars. It's like, does the, the operator trust the vehicle? Um, and in some cases, yes, some cases, no. And that's just an inherent kind of different personal difference. And then sometimes the vehicle does something and you never trust it again. Right. So <laughs> yes, right. So I think about like the research stations that exist today when we've got a fairly elaborate research complex in Antarctica at McMurdo Station and, and other places. Even they're not self sufficient, I mean, but they do have to be self sufficient for many months a year when the weather is just too bad to be able to send in any additional supplies. And they've mm -hmm. added greenhouses and a lot of other sort of interesting ideas to keep the place, keep them sane and fed and healthy, etc. Have what kinds of lessons do you think we've learned from places like Antarctica for this research? Yeah, so um, I appreciate you using some of the terminology that we were throwing around um, and self sufficiency, I think, in kind of the context of my research in the paper and how we're using it on this project. Um, that time constant is really important. So um, the key there is mission duration. Um, so if something is self sufficient, it is for some period of time. Um, and so a good example of this would be, you know, the Skylab missions didn't actually rely on any resupply. Um, and they were self sufficient because they in terms of logistics, because they launch everything all at once. Um, hmm. And in terms of, um, can you repeat the question about the Earth analogs? Oh, just saying like, like, you've got like, you know, you've got McMurro, you've got places that are cut off from mm -hmm. resupply missions for many months. And just what, you know, have we learned a bunch of those lessons? What are some of the really interesting lessons we've learned from, from, you know, I think about submarines, ships at sea, things like that. I'm wondering how those have you know, practicing closer to closer to home before we head off to space. Yeah, yeah. So I'll admit that I'm not as as well versed at some of the analogs on Earth. Um, though I will say, like, there's been a lot of lessons learned in terms of um, just life support and kind of what you can reclaim and just the chemistry that goes on behind making it as close as much of a closed system as you possibly can. Um, obviously, uh, on ISS, the biggest thing that we did was start reclaiming the water. Um, and that was a huge, huge savings in terms of what we had to launch um, for water. And, you know, on, on, in terms of a closed system, closed system on earth, um, there are some things we can do here that are easier here than in space. And that's like growing our own food. Obviously in Antarctica, that's a little bit of a challenge. Um, but you also have the ability to, to go outside and use more of the resources of the actual planet. And you don't necessarily have that in space. Um, and so, right. yeah, there's a little bit more of considerations because in space, everything's, you know, in Antarctica, it's very cold and it feels like the continent's trying to kill you. But in space, it's like everything's really trying to kill you all at once. Yeah, um, I always say that Antarctica is like a thousand times more habitable than the moon or Mars. Like you can go yeah. take a bucket out 
fill it with snow, bring it in, melt it, drink it. Yeah. And you're breathing the whole time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Which right. is quite exactly. exciting. Um, yeah. So then, you know, I think that we, and it's probably science fiction's fault, have this overly romanticized idea of how feasible it is to live on Mars, especially like Mars just feels like it's the Arizona desert to a to a lot of people. How badly or how well you know, how is like how how are we underestimating how inhospitable Mars is? That's a very good question. I, I get more caught up with um... I guess the, the logistics of getting to Mars and getting all the stuff to Mars. Right, I mean, sure. Well, by all means, like include yeah. the, you know, the logistics of getting to Mars compared, you know, compared to getting stuff to the Arizona desert. But, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah take, tackle it any way you want. Yeah. So, I mean, just for starters, you know, we get launch opportunities every, you know, about two years. And so that's, it's usually a few month window. And so you got to launch all your stuff then or pay some sort of price in terms of just waiting longer, using more fuel, um, and so just kind of the, the dance of timing, everything is really important. And, you know, in aerospace, things aren't always on time and, you know, it's really bad. You can't just let, you know, a cargo or a very, like, if you're launching a habitat separate from the crew, you can't like have that be delayed by two years. That needs to go with the crew. Um, and so getting to Mars is, uh, you know, by itself, a huge challenge. We talk a lot, a little bit about um, doing kind of like a fleet style because you want to have redundancy. And when you're traveling that far, that redundancy can even come down to redundant entire ships. So you'd have maybe three ships of crew that are capable of, you know, wh whatever you said before, like three is two is two is one, one yeah, is zero, yeah, yeah. redundancy, right? Um, and so making sure that you are capable of supporting the, the whole crew in case you need to do a return trajectory, right? Um, and then once you get there, landing isn't that easy. I know if, you've, if you're familiar with the Mars rovers, like Mars, we, we, we always kind of joke that Mars has enough of an atmosphere to be a problem, but not enough to help you. Right. Um, so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Mars. So Andy, I always um, say Mars eats spacecraft for breakfast. That's a, that's a great yeah, that's a great phrase. <laughs> it does, and it's hard to you know you're throwing a dart from hundreds of thousands of millions of miles away, and so it's like trying to land your your stuff next to your crew next to your habitat is its own challenge, right? Because you want to be able to have the crew walk to the stuff they need. Um, and once you're there, of course, you get you know it's very cold. You can't breathe the air. You have. Um, uh, you know, you have less gravity, but you still have some gravity. Um, and that's its own challenge. She was like, how do you design a hallway uh, for Mars? Because it's enough to still change the walking gate and maybe have people bouncing like they are on the moon. Um, and so there's all these challenges of like, how do you design for that? Um, and then the dust is its own problem. And the dust is mm. really bad. You don't want that inside your habitat, but you, you know, there's no point in going to Mars if you don't go outside. So you want people to be able to go out and do sorties and do science. Um, you want to keep that dust out. It's, it's not good for lungs. It's not good for equipment. It's not good for anything. So, you know, on, on the one hand, we hear Elon Musk and and the SpaceX fans wanting to go to Mars at like the next available window. If Starship flies in a month from now, then they want to do the 2024 window and off they go to Mars. And I think if you just want to open up the doors and just tumble a bunch of astronauts out onto the surface of Mars and let them fend for themselves, then it's feasible. But there is a laundry list of activities that need to be done. So based on your sort of experience and thinking, what are the highest priorities that that really we have no idea how to do right now that are, could uh, be so critical I, for human survival far away? From I kind of wrap it up in, in terms of uh, we don't know how to go to Mars in a way that keeps astronauts happy right now um, and, and, and as safe as they could be. Right. Um, so the big issues I can think of off the bat are just um, lowering the risk for something like re-entry and launch off of Mars um, is difficult in, in itself. We can do it. We, I think we have the technology and we, if you threw all your resources at it, you could definitely do it. We're trying to do that with Mars sample return. Um, but but we also have, you know, Mars is, we don't really have an atmosphere on Mars. And so there's huge radiation concerns. Um, honestly, there's a lot of consumables you need. And so just making sure you can land all the stuff you need, all the food you need, all the water you need, is its own challenge. Um, and again, like trying to bring some of the lessons learned on station into this, like things break and you need to be able to keep things running um, while you're on Mars. Um, and when you, you have to be able to come back, right? And so there's a lot of like double details in terms of things we theoretically could solve. We just have a lot of considerations that go into it. In terms of unsolvable things, 
gosh, uh, the radiation's a big one. Yep. Um, but that's kind of like, it's, you know, it depends on your risk tolerance for that. Um, same with like the bone, bone loss, um, don't have a good solve for that yet. Um, and so that's just a matter of how risky do you want the astronauts to be when they get there. Um, and to be honest, like there's a lot of just psychological concerns. I'm not saying it's catastrophic, but just like, it's not a fun trip. You know, you're there, you're traveling for months um, and you can't even look at outside your window and see, you know, a bunch of sunrise and sunsets as you can in ISS. And so keeping people, uh, you know, you know, in it and the morale high is actually a, is a huge concern. Hmm. Do you think, I mean, I, I, I mean, I think the ISS is, is interesting because you are, in floating in weightlessness. But as you said, that connection to Earth, it's is if you're so filled with the overview effect every day, that that kind of numbs the, um, I guess the ennui as you travel from world to world, but astronauts are are kind of amazing. Like, whenever you chat with an astronaut, you're just like, Oh, I get why you got this job, you are the best. Um, do you think that that the astronauts are ready psychologically to do this kind of a trip? That is a, that is a great question. Um, I entered this project with the assumption that, you know, astronauts are kind of a different breed of human. Yeah. Um, it's, a lot of them are, I have military backgrounds, so frankly, as well. And they're, you know, willing to, you know, maybe put up with more than the average person would. Um, and so our PI on this project actually is Steve Robinson, who was, um, who was an astronaut on shuttle and, mm -hmm. Um, he has had some comments. I'm not going to try to quote him exactly, but you know, he's made some comments that are just like astronauts are people too. And so there is still a limit, uh, to kind of what they can tolerate. Um, I don't know if you've read, um, Scott Kelly's book, yep. but yeah, that was super kind of, I think one of the, the best, um, pros and cons of being in space books where he talks a lot about just, you know, missing grass, missing rain, missing food, missing putting a glass down on a, on a table and having it not float away. Um, yeah, the, the one that freaked me out, the, the unsettling thought as you close your eyes and you see your cosmic ray flashes yeah. in your, in your retinas, knowing that you're being bathed in radiation and you're, and they're protected by the atmosphere. And so like, you can just imagine how much worse it would be as you're, or they're protected by the, by the magnetosphere of the earth. You just imagine how bad it would be on a flight to another planet just on and on and on oh yeah it gets to you and i you know i'm not going to try to say that all astronauts are perfect or yeah. they're going to be worried about it because it'll depend on the person but yeah so then i guess fast forward i'd like to speculate a little now you know one of the ideas obviously that elon musk wants to send a million people to mars by 2050 and have it be a self-sustaining second basket for for humanity's eggs how far science fiction-y do you think that idea is? That is a, that's a good question. Um, you know, Elon Musk, I, I admit that I'm not super up to date on his exact plans in terms of terraforming. I know terraforming. Well, not even terraforming, just, you just know, sending. just sending a million people every time, every Mars window, you send a thousand starships and you have them build a city on Mars? Um, I think you're going to have a tough time getting a million people who want to go every time we have a window, frankly. I, well, uh, that, that in the beginning, that feels to me like, like the least problem. Like you could probably find a million people who would like to go to Mars. They think they'd yeah. like to go to Mars. I don't know whether you would find a, you know, you would, if you interviewed them 10 years later, you had a million people that were glad they went to Mars. That's kind of the, the sticker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But but I think like right now you're looking at these, at this, this in between time, like right now, the international space station is utterly dependent on regular resupply flights, swapping out parts, sending out more toilet paper, everything. Mm -hmm. While the moon is this in, in between part where, where there's going to be a certain level of, of self-sufficiency with resupply missions, Mars is going to be even worse. And then getting to that full, complete independence how i just wonder how like what would be the journey to accomplish that do you think yeah uh yeah there's, you're in, there's you're a lot. in charge like you just got in charge of make mars independent 
how yeah. would you want to approach it? I would send a lot of farming robots and a lot of greenhouses is what I would start with, um, <laughs> frankly. So yeah, I would figure out how how to assemble things with robots. So you'd need to be able to assemble habitats so people could live when they get there. You want to be able to assemble potentially landing pads, um, launch pads, things, you know, infrastructure. Um, having a food supply, that's the biggest one too, is just making sure you can you can do that. And also close the loop on on bio on um life support. And so right now, like we're we're, you know, we do a pretty good job closing the loop on ISS, but there's still stuff, you know, we we can't reclaim and and having something like Biosphere 2, like this big greenhouse building that is capable of basically being a closed system like that. That's really important. Um, and that, that's very sci-fi, right? But um, that's, I think, kind of the the priority there. Yeah, I, f- I feel like like shutting down Biosphere 2 was one of the biggest mistakes in working out this technology that I think people thought they were crazy. And yet, if we can't sort out all of the factors that play a role in in keeping a station completely self sufficient, we can never do it. And Earth is the easiest place to, to, to try this out. Have you have you been there? Have you seen the, the Biosphere 2? No, I have not. No. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to I'd love to go and, and check it out sometime. I yeah, it's weird because people like roll their eyes when they hear about Biosphere 2. But then they want to talk about a moon colony. And you're just like, yeah, we should we should we should figure this out. What about some of the trickier problems like radiation and lower gravity? Yeah, so lower, lower gravity, I mean, that's the, the easy answer is artificial gravity, right? So you, you spin something on your way there, and that's either some giant kind of um, toroidal structure, or you have maybe like a tether and you spin, you know, two point masses basically on your way there. Um, and that definitely, you know, there's some some physiological concerns with like how fast you spin, um, kind of inner ear effects, but um, that's one solution. <laughs> and that's, that's a little bit of like a, a what if, right? Because the, the main concern with the, the bone loss in terms of getting to Mars is that someone might hurt themselves while trying to assemble a habitat before they can readjust to Martian gravity. And so that's a little bit of, of speculation. Um, in terms of radiation, we know we know it's bad, <laughs> but that's also something that's, you know, radiation is, is a life is a lifetime um, kind of tracking. And that also just increases your risk of, of cancer. And so I've heard people say, send older people, um, which is an interesting take where it's, you know, you send people who are 50 or 60 and um, I, you know, take, take from that what you will, but you know, they have less of a risk of developing cancer in the time they have left. Um, right. And so that, that's, a, that's one solution. The other solution is to try to radiation proof your habitat. And you can do that by there's, there's a lot of ways, but keeping, you know, water or fluid or materials on the outside that are, um, more radiation proof kind of helps. That's, um, that's interesting. That, that idea of sending old people is, you know, once you're in space, then you you're not so reliant on your muscles because you're floating in in microgravity and even being on the surface of mars you could you could lift three times what you would normally be able to lift so even someone who's fairly you know has lower muscle mass would be able to carry around a lot of of gear and so on and even jump around i i like that idea but i think at the same time it i think for a lot of people that's kind of unsettling that idea that you're sending people who are willing to take a bigger radiation load and get cancer. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of, I mean, to be frank, like ethical questions about sending people to somewhere like Mars. Um, the kind of baseline is that like, you know, when you become an astronaut, you're basically signing over your health data, right? Because you, you're not really anonymized because there's only been a few hundred astronauts. Right. Um, and going to Mars, it's like, well, we can't guarantee that, you know, bad effects aren't going to really happen. Right. And so, there's definitely some ethical considerations about that. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. I mean, there's ethical considerations about the, about the whole thing. I mean, one of the things that I always bring up is on the moon and especially Mars, we don't know what one sixth gravity, one third gravity does to the human body over long periods of time. And if so, if you do want to send a million people to Mars, what if babies can't gestate properly on Mars? What's the answer? Yeah, and that's stuff that we need to think about now before we start making claims about doing that right and we need to sort that out yeah. here <laughs> yeah 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 uh, and ideally with other mammals first before we attempt to run these experiments on human beings with no real recourse yeah it's, uh, absolutely. it's, it's kind of tricky so what what comes next for your research like at this point you've made a bunch of recommendations for ways to improve the autonomy and self-sufficiency of 
future space stations. What ideas are you thinking about after this? Yeah, so, so my work is really focused on that broader return on investment strategy. So looking at ways to quantify um, just how earth reliant will different technology make us. Um, and so I'm looking at it from a holistic system level. And so if you think of the habitat and the crew as a, as a control volume and you add certain technology, um, what can it give you in terms of reducing either that communication reliance, that logistic reliance, um, or even reliance on crew? Like, can we, you know, what technology is the best for helping out crew members? Um, and so there's a lot that goes into that and really trying to figuring out how to quantify that and give people um, a methodology for making those decisions early on in the design phase that we don't have to, you know, necessarily dump a bunch of money into these options and then compare them once we've got a version that's ready for flight. Because right now, the way we do that is by comparing, okay, what's the mass? Like, what's the power? How reliable is it? Um, and so trying to find those promising avenues and those promising, you know, candidate technologies early on um, and quantify that early based on um, those types of figures of merit is really important. What's an experiment that you would love to be able to run or series of experiments? Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm lucky because we're, we're doing some of them. We're doing <laughs> demos of different things and comparing, um, you know, human versus autonomy performance and seeing if we can, you know, design things such that they can um, automatically sense when there's an anomaly and detect that anomaly and then also maybe prescribe a solution. So say your ECLIS um, system breaks down in some way, can you figure out what the problem was, where it is, and then recommend a solution and do it in a way that the astronaut trusts it, right? And it's not just, you're not just pulling something out of a hat. It actually understands that you went through the process. Um, and so I'm lucky enough that we are doing some of those experiments that I would, would want to. <laughs> I think something, um, just, just talking with more astronauts is always, well, we're lucky enough to have a few astronauts on our project also, but but talking to just getting more perspectives is always really important because there's only so much I can imagine as, as a designer. And so, um, yeah, doing stuff like actual demos in flight would be amazing. So on ISS. Do you think, I mean, ISS was launched as a, a science platform and it, you know, now it is 20 plus years old and definitely starting to wear down. And we're already talking about the end of life for ISS. But at the same time, it feels like a fraction of the science that could and should have been done have have been completed so far. I mean, I could I think I could list off 100 ideas, questions that I have about about space for interesting experiments. And it's are we going to really lose a serious science platform when we lose ISS? I think so. Um, I think. But well, I think other people are realizing that too, right? That's why we have some of the commercial players coming into the field with different space stations, because a lot of people, people will pay to, to do experiments in microgravity. Um, and, you know, there, there are some things and some, a lot of different chemistry that we like don't really fully understand and if gravity has an effect on that. Um, and obviously all the biological processes that we, we talked about in trying to um, understand the effects of aging and the effects of microgravity on the body. Um, and you can only do that in long-term effects in, in space, so. Yeah, it, it's interesting, the, the Axiom space crew, the the private astronauts who paid their way to go up to the space station for end up being up there for about 10 days, apparently they complained that they were having to work too hard, that they had to spend too much time doing science. And I guess an astronaut could have said, oh, this is sort of how, this is how it works. You know, this is important. This is important work. I wonder what NASA will do when the station does deorbit to answer these, these questions. I mean, there's, there will be the lunar gateway, but there won't be this platform anymore. There's going to be private companies, as you as you said, do you think that's sufficient? That depends a lot on what this these private companies end up looking like in terms of their design yeah. and kind of how much um, we can rely on them in terms of sending, you know, NASA astronauts up to those stations. Um, and so I'd like to imagine that I mean, there's definitely my, my prediction is that NASA would would spend you know money kind of like car, uh, commercial crew in the way that we're you know paying for these launches to send our astronauts to to ISS. Um, we would just book time, so we'd have you know maybe a lab space, um, and through a combination of collaborating with different payload managers and different science experiments, we would launch all of those together and have you know maybe the best microbiologists in the world go up to um, some space station and be able to perform their experiments up there, uh, which I think would would be really cool. 
Um, I do think Gateway also has a fair amount of science planned for it as well. Just mm-hmm. obviously that's a little bit more complicated because they have to get out to, to where Gateway would be. But. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot more expensive, a lot more technically complicated and a lot of a worse, I mean, it's it's a more Spartan existence compared to the capabilities of the International Space Station. I do worry. I, I feel like it's almost like it's now really outputting the science that we need to understand this. And it yeah, feels it, took, it took a long sad. time to get there. To, yeah. It took a long time to get up to that productivity level, actually. Um, there was some, I'm forgetting which year it was, but it was a significant chunk into ISS's lifetime where it was finally like ringing the bell. We got an eight hour work day in because the time had been spent doing things like maintenance and working out and, you know, really important things and, you know, hours of meetings with ground. And um, I, I totally agree. I think we yeah. maybe underappreciated ISS, I think. Um, and and it, and I think right now it's a line item in a budget that needs to be freed up to allow for launching space launch systems and building the lunar gateway and and various other stuff. But I think that, you know, it's like Hubble versus James Webb. I mean, Hubble is oversubscribed. You could yeah. you could launch five more Hubbles and they would still be oversubscribed. And and yet, you know, I guess the it the progress continues. And I don't know what the I don't know what the answer is. I mean, the Chinese have their space station, they're going to be doing a bunch of science there. Uh, maybe there could be some kind of collaboration between the Americans and the Chinese to to allow them to perform some of the experiments. It's I, I think that I think I don't think we've learned enough to be able to take these next steps yet. And I do worry. Personally. Yeah. Yeah, I think I do too. And I'd love to see collaboration. I think I think space has always been a really um, good open door for um, international collaboration, as we saw from ISS. So, yeah, yeah, interesting. So what do you where do you see humanity in the future? You know, what's sort of like the the vision for humanity's place in space that that excites you? Yeah, wow. I mean, this is your Um, career, you've dedicated yourself to this. What's (laughs) good to get a bed? I, I feel like I'm maybe uh, not what people expect. I think I think of a certain aspect of space is always going to be. I hope for science um, and maybe not for military use, but I'd like to see it really be democratized in a way that I think you know we've we've spoken about and people have been speaking about in terms of the commercial space for a long time. But like you know, what does democratization mean when it's still millionaires launching into space? Um, and so I'd really like to see that that launch costs go down. But I'd love to see um, there just be more opportunities for for scientists, for people who have experiments, for people who want to fly to do them, right? And I think we're, we're hopefully seeing that. Um, and frankly, I like to see just get get more multidisciplinary people involved in that, right? Right now we have um, all the stations that have been designed in, in LEO have been um, kind of the, the, the tube, tube soda can connection, um, you know, very much just like engineers who looked at a rocket and were like, what can we launch on that? Um, and I want to see people who are architects, people who are, um, you know, Maybe we have space sports, right? Like, what would that look like? Yeah, um, yeah. And have that really expand in a way, especially in Leo, because it's so close to Earth. Um, that's accessible in a way that you know we do research on on different aspects of human life in space. It would be really cool to see like a poet go to space, or a f- filmmaker yeah. spend time just recording, but like six months of just recording documentaries and and just using space you see snippets of it like when our beloved chris hadfield went to the station and he did a music video science repeat and i wonder if there's a way that we can kind of live vicariously through them as they express more of humanity's what makes us interesting i think yeah, and I think my other kind of maybe not it's a lukewarm take is that I think one of the most important things space can give us is um, it is a contrast to Earth, right? It makes us look back and, and be grateful for why we have Earth. Um, yeah. And so that that's a big thing for me. And I think having the words to describe that um, is really important and really shedding light on just like why we value this planet. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of my take on that. <laughs> it, it well, I mean, that's interesting and. It, you know, and this is sort of this this 
struggle that I have with doing the job that I do, which is advocating for space exploration and being excited about humanity's future in space. And the reality is the more that I think about it, the more I talk about it, the more I just love Earth. And the more I appreciate the planet that we have and, and start to think like, boy, you know, if yeah, you got a week of like, I'm on Mars, can you believe it? And then then you've got like, I want to see a tree. Right, then you're just in the Utah desert. And you then you're in the Utah out. desert, but you can't <laughs> breathe. Right. So yeah. it's so it, it feels uh, it I, I know I know that feeling that, that, that it's made me appreciate our planet more. And I yeah. think that this exploration helps us appreciate it even more at an almost like a human race level. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know if you're a, a Star Trek fan, but I'm like, a, I'm a pretty big Star Trek of course. fan. I think, like, I, yeah. Yeah. Something I think a lot about is just like, who do, you know, there's, there's two things. There's, you know, what is humanity when we are separate from earth? And then who do we want to put forward? Like who as a species do we want to portray ourselves as when we go forward? Um, and so I think that's why I, I really want to seek care when going to somewhere like even you know even mars where it's like we want to think about who we are when we are there what are we doing why are we going there are we just going there to like you know it's like seeing mount everest and seeing you know litter on the side of mount everest like that's really tragic to me and so i'd love to see like have people think about like why we are going and what our goals are and um i'd love to see us go but i just want to see you know a real thought be put into it um and take care of those places when we go yeah yeah yeah, I, like, I do like this idea of maintaining vast chunks of the solar system, even if no life is found, as just wilderness. Yeah. To, to be able to stand on the edge of Valles Marineris and just appreciate the biggest valley and, or biggest chasm in the in the solar system would be incredible. Or it's, and and I think that there are going to be a lot of places that will have that meaningful impact, and maybe later on our technology will trivialize our ability to get out there into, into the solar system. Oh, I'd love to see it. But yeah, I totally, yeah. totally agree. Yeah. And I think there's, yeah, that kind of, that kind of goes into the conversation about like, why do we think we own these rocks floating around? Right. And like, um, there's a lot of cool work. I know, um, I think Danielle Wood and some people in the MIT uh, media lab have hosted talks from indigenous scholars about kind of that conversation about, um, colonialism and, and ownership and, how do you, how do we act when we explore and kind of what the language is around that? And like, I'm not an expert on it, but I really appreciate that we're having those conversations come in as well. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 for sure. I think, I mean, we have to first figure out if there's, if they're just dead rocks, like that's a really key distinction yeah. that we have to sort out. And yeah. even then, but even if they are dead rocks, they are beautiful rocks. And there are places that are, that are really nice, even here on, here on earth, which are, you know, the air, parts of the Arizona desert that yep. that you want them to remain the way they look those cool weird rounded rocks and those formations and the solar system we don't even know what the solar system has in store for us yet so yeah it's pretty exciting well Annika it's been a pleasure talking with you if people want to keep track of your work what's the best way to do that oh gosh um I do have a website it's just Annika um and I keep just kind of a running um, kind of portfolio resume on there. Um, I'm also on, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, and those are kind of my main academic um, academic social medias. Yep. Um, so yeah, that's probably the best way to keep Perfect. track of me. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And if some of your suggestions are implemented into the Lunar Gateway, please, please let me know. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. All right, take care.